The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, so I hope you can hear me. Uh, welcome back, everybody. I hope you have the full energy back from um, Thanksgiving vacation. Everybody, uh, welcome back. Um, so before we uh, start, uh, we'll talk about uh, where, where we are now. Um, so this is actually the, the goal which we set for L3 on the beginning. So what we have, uh, what we have been uh, discussing is to uh, learn about how to translate physical situations into mathematics. Uh, simple uh, harmonic oscillator, coupled oscillators, etc., and uh, uh, we uh, try to put together infinite number of oscillators, and uh, we found waves uh, from this uh, uh, this uh, interesting exercise. And of course, we learned about Fourier decompositions of waves, and also uh, learned about how to put together physical systems. In order to do that, you need to define boundary conditions, and those conditions need to be satisfied so that you can describe multiple uh, physical systems altogether. And uh, the third part of the course, we have been focusing on uh, many, many applications. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, for the phenomena related to electromagnetic waves, uh, and also many practical uh, applications and optics, and uh, pretty, we are pretty close to uh, the discussion uh, between wave and vibrations and uh, the future uh, uh, course, which is L4, the connections to quantum mechanics. And if we have time, we will talk about gravitational waves uh, if we uh, manage to, to do that. Okay, it, it depends on how, how fast we process. Okay, so, uh, so let's start the lecture today. So uh, first, we will uh, give you a short review. Before the Thanksgiving, we are talking about uh, polarizer filters, and uh, we have been uh, researching how to make a very good photo so that you can post it on Facebook, right? So that's essentially what we learned. So if you want to take uh, uh, a picture of the sky, which is deep blue, then you need to use the polarizer. And the reason uh, we also understand that is because if you uh, look at uh, the sky, which is actually roughly uh, uh, 45 or uh, to 90 degrees uh, away from the direction of the sun, basically uh, what you get is, the, is that all those uh, light from scattering between the sunlight and the molecule or little uh, dust uh, in, the, in the sky uh, become polarized light. Therefore, you can actually filter them using the polarizer, okay? Of course, you have to tune your polarizer carefully so that you can actually uh, uh, minimize the, the light from the sky so that you get sharper uh, image in, uh, in, your, in your photo. And also we discussed about, uh, okay, with polarizer, uh, polarization filter, uh, we can actually filter out also the refracted light, for, for example, from, from the water or from the, uh, from, the, from the window of a car. And that is because uh, something which is closely related to the boundary condition uh, which we learned about uh, uh, from Maxwell's equation in matter. And this is actually the four equations which we discussed last time. And that actually, uh, we were using that to explain uh, the incident light uh, when, uh, from, uh, from air uh, toward uh, something which is denser, uh, for example, like a glass. And then we found that if we start with uh, unpolarized light, okay, this incident wave is uh, unpolarized light. What we found is that the transmitted wave, which is actually uh, uh, the, in the bottom of this uh, uh, diagram, is actually still um, uh, uh, kind of uh, pretty close to uh, unpolarized light, but uh, slightly polarized because of the uh, transmission and the boundary condition. And the refracted light is actually something very interesting happened is that uh, uh, only the component, which is actually the uh, polarizing the direction which, such that the uh, electric field is oscillating uh, uh, in the direction uh, uh, perpendicular to the surface of this uh, 
uh, of the slide will survive, and uh, that actually give you a polarized uh, light, uh, going, uh, uh, which is actually refracted from the surface. And uh, this interesting uh, uh, phenomenon uh, uh, reach the maxima, the, you get a fully polarized light uh, uh, when you actually uh, set the incident angle of the unpolarized light at uh, so-called Brewster's angle. And uh, this Brewster's angle is uh, happening when the refracted light and the transmitted light uh, direction actually, uh, uh, they are orthogonal to, to each other. And uh, that actually give you the maxima effect we are looking for. OK, so that's actually what we have learned from uh, electromagnetic wave in matter and uh, also matching the boundary conditions between, uh, 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 between, uh, uh, between uh, the uh, e electromagnetic waves in inside the material and uh, in the air, such that we actually uh, learn about all those interesting phenomena. And uh, basically, we have learned how to describe electromagnetic waves uh, how to add electromagnetic waves together, how they propagate, okay, from one position to, to the other position, and uh, how the boundary condition works and the uh, equation of motion, etc., and uh, something related to uh, dielectric material. And uh, today, what we are going to do is to put all the things we have learned together and uh, see we, if we can actually explain a very interesting phenomena. Uh, so uh, before uh, I start, uh, I will uh, show you uh, a, sh uh, a demonstration, which I'm not sure if I was, uh, uh, if that will be successful. It's very difficult, actually. And of course, uh, during the break, you can come, you are welcome to come over and uh, play with all those demos. And uh, here I have um, two sticks, and uh, I, I'm going to create a soap bubble, OK, from this soap uh, water, and then uh, see if I will be, uh, I will make it or not. So basically, I, I put this into the soap, uh, soap water, and I will try, and to try to open it, and to see if I can create a bubble. Yeah, <laughs> you can see, we, you can see that uh, there's a colorful soap bubble created. Oh, okay. It's, you can see that it's not always easy. Oh, it's getting very messy now. <laughs> I'm trying to destroy the classroom, but it's OK, because we are in IT. You can see that it's really beautiful. It's colorful, OK? Uh, it, 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 it for a while, then, uh, then it breaks, OK? And of course, during the break, you are welcome to, to do this. And it's actually non-trivial to create this size of bubble, OK? So, so the success rate is like 50%. <laughs> OK, so as you can see from this demonstration, we see something really beautiful. Uh, uh, this bubble is colorful, right? And, uh, and uh, I didn't actually shine this, bu uh, this uh, soap bubble by all kinds of different uh, you know, preset colors, right? So, so it appeared automatically. I'm just shining it with all kinds of different whatever wavelengths I get from your, your from the light setting here. Okay, pretty bright light uh, on my face, uh, and uh, you can see that it become colorful, and uh, we are going to understand what is going on and what, where this color is coming coming from. Okay, and and. Uh, and uh, the, the good news is that, based on the knowledge we have learned, uh, we, can, we are in a very good position to understand uh, this phenomenon. So uh, before we start to explain uh, uh, this phenomenon, I would like to talk about uh, a phenomenon so-called interference, OK? So suppose we have two electromagnetic waves. We can actually add them together because of superposition principle. So what we can do is that uh, suppose I have two e electro uh, electric field. E1 is actually uh, e a, uh, it's defined as A1 cosine omega t minus kz plus phi1 in the x direction. So by now, uh, you should know that this is actually a Electro, electric field propagating at the angular frequency omega with uh, 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 a wave, uh, wave number k 
going toward positive z direction with, uh, and uh, the electric field is perpendicular to the direction of propagation in the, in the x direction and, the y, and also uh, this uh, uh, electro, uh, electric field have a phase of phi one. Okay, so that's actually what uh, we, we know already uh, by now. What does this mean, this expression mean? And it's actually a harmonic uh, oscillating electric, uh, electric field. And of course, uh, since I am talking about interference, basically I can uh, add this, the first electric field uh, to, uh, uh, and the, the second electric field together and see what will happen. So now if I define the second uh, electric field to be A2, which is the amplitude cosine omega t minus kz. Basically, they have the same uh, wavelength and the, also the uh, angular frequency plus uh, phi 2. But they have different uh, phase. And of course, they, in this setup, I ask them to be pointing to the same direction, which is the x direction. Okay. So we were wondering what is going to happen if I super uh, uh, if I consider the superposition of these two uh, electric field, okay? And the total electric field, which is called the E vector, is actually the uh, E1 plus E2, okay? So before that, I would like to remind you about a uh, uh, pointing vector and uh, also the, the so-called intensity. So pointing vector is actually defined as uh, this uh, x vector, pointing vector, is equal to 1 over mu 0 e cross b. Right? So this is actually the directional flux of uh, energy per unit area. Right? So that is actually uh, the, uh, the pointing vector which we uh, have been using uh, for, for a while. And also uh, another reminder is that given the electric field, uh, electric field which is actually a uh, harmonic focusing wave, the corresponding B field will be equal to uh, uh, 1 over V. V is actually the, the, the speed of the light in, in some uh, specific material. And uh, K, is actually, K hat is actually the direction of propagation uh, across uh, E. This will give you the, uh, the magnitude and also the direction of the, the uh, Mag uh, the corresponding magnetic field for the uh, electromagnetic waves. Okay, so so now I'm interested in what will be the resulting intensity i if I uh, try to uh, superpose these two, uh, uh, try to put together these two uh, electric field. Okay, as you can see that these two electric fields have different phase. The first one have phase phi one, the second one have phase phi two, okay? So this means that they may reach maxima or minima at different uh, uh, position uh, in space. Uh, in, in this case, is uh, in the z direction. And what I'm actually uh, 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 defining here is uh, actually two uh, prime waves, okay? And uh, so it really depends on what will be the relative uh, phase for the first and second electromagnetic wave, okay? In order to quantify how much they cancel each other or how much they enhance each other, what I'm going to do is to evaluate the intensity of the, uh, of the, uh, the resulting electromagnetic waves. And what is actually intensity? Intensity is actually the amplitude of the uh, pointing vector. So I write it as uh, uh, the length of the uh, S vector, pointing vector. And I can, of course, calculate what will be the, uh, the value of this, uh, or, or say the length of the pointing vector. This will be equal to 1 over mu 0. OK, based on this equation here, just a reminder. And I would like to know what will be the length of the uh, E uh, cross uh, B field. That will give you the length of the pointing vector. And uh, basically, what you're going to get is that you are going to get 1 over uh, uh, mu 0 times, since uh, you, the, B, the B field is actually uh, highly related to the electric field, 
and uh, it takes a heat of one over uh, one over v, right? Okay, in, in terms of the size of the amplitude. So basically, you are going to get uh, one over v squared. Okay, and uh, and the, this uh, cross product actually uh, is okay because it becomes. Uh, uh, e square because uh, B field and uh, E field are always orthogonal to each other. And uh, I can uh, now rewrite this V. V is actually the velocity of the uh, speed of uh, the light in matter. So basically, what I can rewrite is that this will become uh, uh, C, uh, uh, 1 over V will become uh, C over uh, N, which is actually the, uh, the the, the, the refractive index of a specific material, and still I have E squared here. Okay, finally I can rewrite uh, C, uh, this formula since uh, C is equal to square root of one over square root of mu zero epsilon zero, right? Therefore, I can rewrite this expression, okay, in terms of uh, epsilon zero, and what I'm going to get is C times uh, n times epsilon zero e squared. So basically, what I do is that I multiply both the uh, 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 numerator and the denominator by by c, and also I write uh, 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 by uh, and uh, I actually uh, use this expression. Then I can actually cancel the mu zero and write everything in terms of c, uh, n, and uh, epsilon zero. Okay. So, so until here, there were basically no magic. Basically, it's just uh, uh, rewriting uh, uh, the, the, the length of the, uh, uh, the pointing vector uh, in, in terms of uh, n and also the electric field. So now, what I'm going to do is to plug in this expression into that formula, OK, and see what we are going to get. So let me evaluate what will be the e squared, the length of the e squared. So basically, uh, the definition of the e is uh, shown here is a superposition of e1 and the e2. Therefore, I can now quickly write down what will be uh, e squared uh, here. Okay. So so basically, uh, the first, basically you are going to get uh, a one square cosine square omega t minus kz plus phi 1. Basically, that is coming from E1 times E1, right? The second term, which I'm going to get, is actually E2 times E2, right? E2 times E2, you are going to get A2 squared cosine squared omega t minus kz plus phi 2, right? Basically, based on this equation, and I square it, and uh, basically I get the second term here. Okay, and finally, what I'm going to get is the third term, which is actually e1 times e2. So basically, what I'm going to get is a1. Uh, basically, you are going to get two times a1, a2 cosine omega t minus kz plus phi one cosine omega t minus kz plus phi 2, which is actually the cross term of this uh, uh, e vector square. OK, any questions so far? OK, I hope this is uh, pretty uh, straightforward to you. And of course, I can now rewrite this uh, product is two cosine, uh, cosine times cosine, right? Basically, I can rewrite this uh, using the formula uh, which we have uh, related to cosine times cosine. Basically, I can rewrite this as uh, one half cosine two omega t minus two kz plus phi one plus phi two plus one over two cosine phi 1 minus phi 2. So basically, the first term is actually collecting the content of the two cosine and a length together. The second uh, term is actually uh, calculating the difference between the content of the cosine uh, function uh, and the 
what I'm going to get is actually phi 1 minus phi 2. OK? Now, based on this definition, intensity uh, i is actually equal to uh, the magnitude of the pointing vector. So remember, what our goal is to evaluate what will be the resulting uh, average uh, intensity. So now I can calculate what will be the average intensity over one period. OK, so this will be uh, equal to 1 over t, integration over 0 to t, one period. And uh, uh, the instantaneous uh, uh, intensity i uh, dt. OK? And what I'm going to get is that, OK, so we have three terms. The first term is here, which is actually a1 squared cosine squared uh, some, uh, something related co uh, to omega t. And uh, the second term is here. It's also uh, uh, proportional to cosine squared omega t. And finally, we, we have two terms here, which is actually uh, proportional to cosine uh, uh, 2 omega t. And finally, the last term is actually independent of time. OK? So what, I, what, 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 I, uh, what I'm going to do is to evaluate individual terms. So the first term, basically, a1 squared cosine squared omega t. So by now, you, uh, it should be uh, pretty straightforward for you. If I integrate cosine square over one period of time, basically, what you are going to get is 1 half, right? OK, so that is actually done uh, several times in the, in, the, in the P set. So basically, what you are going to get is, so I'm going to collect all those constants from here and copy here. here. So you basically, you have c times n times f strong 0, okay, which is actually coming from the definition of uh, 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 intensity. And then uh, this is actually, uh, for the first term, what, what I'm going to get is a1 squared divided by 2. This 1 half is actually just the integral related to cosine squared. Uh, similarly, you are going to get the same uh, result, uh, very similar result for the second term. The second term is going to give you a2 squared divided by 2, right? OK. Finally, you can have the third term. The third term is going to be give you what value? Can somebody help me? Zero. Yes, 0, right? Because this is actually cosine 2 omega t, right? So if you do integrate over one period, you are going to get 0 plus 0. Each period, you give you 0, right? So 0 plus 0 is 0. So therefore, you get 0. Very good. How about the last time? L the last turn? Anybody can help, help me? Two That's right, right? Because it says constant. OK, so average of a constant is a constant which is actually giving you 1 over 2 times um, uh, a 2 times a1 times a2 cosine phi 1 minus phi 2. Of course, I can cancel this uh, 1 half, which is actually coming from here, and the 2, which is coming from here. And basically, you are getting a1, a2, cosine phi 1 minus phi 2. OK, and I need to close. Any questions so far? OK, so, so what we have been doing is that I evaluate uh, the total electric field. If I super, uh, basically calculate the superposition of the two fields, and then I am interested in what would be the average intensity coming from this field. And I write down E squared explicitly. There are four terms, and only three of, the, three, three of them actually survive. And the basically, uh, the expression I'm getting is, uh, uh, ex is like this. Basically, you have uh, some constant multiplied by a1 squared over 2 plus a2 squared over 2 plus a1, a2 cosine phi 1 minus phi 2. You can see that the intensity depends on phi 1 and the phi 2, right? So, so this actually would change the resulting intensity. 
Okay, so in order to get some ideas about uh, what does that mean and uh, also how does the intensity, the average intensity change uh, as a function of uh, phi 1 minus phi 2, what I'm going to do is to define phi 1 minus phi 2 to be delta, okay, which I will call it phase difference. Okay? Then I would like to plot phi, uh, the, 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 the average intensity i as a function of delta. Okay, and see what is going to happen. So this is actually the result. So if I have the x-axis to be delta, which is actually phi 1 minus phi 2, okay, and the y-axis is intensity, okay, of course I would like to take out the, the constant, which is c times n times epsilon 0. So I, I'm plotting the y-axis is uh, average intensity divided by C times n times epsilon zero. Okay, what I'm going to get is something which is actually oscillating up and down, like this. Okay, so the maxima value happens. The maxima value happens when delta is equal to zero. Right, when delta is equal to zero, what is going to happen? This means that cosine delta is equal to one, right? Therefore, what you are going to get is a1 squared over two plus a2 squared over two plus a1, a2, okay? Okay, this is actually when delta is equal to zero and the intensity actually reach maximum, and the, the maximum value is actually 1 over 2 a1 plus a2 squared, right, based on this uh, calculation, okay? On the other hand, you can actually expect that the intensity reach a minimum when delta is equal to which value? Anybody can help me? Pi, yes. Right? When delta is pi, what is going to happen? Cosine pi is minus 1. So therefore, what you are getting is 1 over 2 a1 squared plus a2 squared minus 2 a1 a2. And that will give you 1 over 2 a1 minus a2 squared. You can see that when the delta is equal to 0, or when the delta is equal to 2 pi, for example. Okay, if you uh, increase the, delta, uh, the, the, the phase difference large enough, or the delta is actually 4 pi. All those numbers will give you maxima constructive interference. Okay, so what does that mean? That means uh, you are adding these two electric fields in the most efficient way. Okay. On the other hand, when the value of the delta is equal to pi, or equal to three pi, or equal to five pi, etc., okay, the intensity, the average intensity, reach a minimum. Okay, that means actually instead of adding them, you are actually canceling them. You are canceling the electric field. Of the, uh, of the first and the second uh, 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 electromagnetic wave, okay? And that will give you a maxima intensity, which is 1 over 2 a1 minus a2 uh, squared. Just a reminder, uh, this a1 and a2 is actually the amplitude of the first and second uh, electric field, okay? So what will happen if I set a1 equal to a2? If I set A1 to equal to A2, that means the minima will be equal to what? Zero. Yeah, very good. How about the maxima? Will be A1 plus A2, right? So basically, uh, you are going to get four times larger value compared to uh, uh, the intensity before you add them together. So individual intensity is I. And after adding them together with delta equal to zero, you are going to 
get four times larger intensity if the amplitude of the first and second electric field is the same. Okay, so very good. So, so that's actually the, the result of the calculation, and you can see that the amount of intensity we can get out of this highly depends on uh, the delta, which is actually the phase difference between the first and the second electric field. Okay, can we actually get some more feeling about this addition? Okay, so what I'm going to do is to again write everything down in terms of uh, 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 imaginary number or, or, or say complex uh, number. Okay, so if I have a, uh, a, 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 a rewrite the electric field uh, E1 as a real part of A1 exponential I phi 1 exponential I omega T minus KZ, okay, in the x direction. And I can also rewrite the, the uh, expression for the second electric field to be the real part of A2 exponential I phi 2 exponential I omega T minus KZ, again, in the x direction, okay? So if I add these two uh, fields together, what I'm doing is like in the complex plan, I have an image in uh, the number uh, contribution in the, in the y direction, and the real part is actually in the x direction, okay? Suppose omega t minus kz is zero, okay? At some instant of time, omega t minus kz is equal to zero. So what I'm doing is that, okay, I have the first vector, which is actually presenting the, the contribution of the first uh, electric field, and the, it, this uh, electric field is going to be phi one, pointing to a direction phi one away from the uh, real axis, okay? With amplitude equal to A1, right? This is actually what we learned already from, from the first lecture. And then if I add the second uh, uh, electric field, what I'm going to get is that I'm going to get another vector Okay, which is actually A2 uh, in length. And uh, uh, the angle is phi 2 here. Okay? So what I'm getting, is the resulting uh, uh, amplitude is actually when I take the real part of the first and second expression, uh, adding them together, okay, basically, I am taking a projection to the real axis. And that is actually the resulting uh, 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 amplitude of the, 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 the electric field, which is actually the superposition of the first and second field. Okay? So you can see that when, when phi 1 and the phi 2 when phi 1 is equal to phi 2, okay? What is going to happen is the following. So basically, what you are going to get is that the, you are increasing the length of the, the, the resulting uh, vector, which is addition of the two vectors. Uh, you are actually getting a maxima out of this addition, right? Because phi 1 is equal to phi 2, therefore, these two vectors form a straight line. Okay? Therefore, you can actually add and get the maximum amount of the um, uh, amplitude out of this. Okay? On the other hand, when phi 1 uh, minus phi 2 is, is pi, okay? which is actually, uh, which I define as delta. Okay? When this happens, what is going to happen is that what we are doing is like addition of two vectors in a complex plane, but they are pointing to the opposite direction. Okay, so the first one will be like this, and the second one will be looking like that, and they are actually trying to cancel each other. 
Okay, so that's actually how you can actually understand what is happening with different uh, delta value. In this case, delta is equal to zero. The phase difference is equal to zero. And then in the second case, phase difference is equal to pi. And what happened in between is like this, right? You are adding them sort of together, but not in the most efficient way or the most destructive way. Uh, and uh, you are actually evaluating what will be the resulting amplitude by uh, looking at the vector sum of the first and second field. Okay, so I hope that this will give you some more intuition about what we have been doing. Okay, any questions so far? All right, so now we are actually in a very good position. Once we actually understand this uh, uh, superposition of the two electric field and the interference, basically the size of the resulting intensity will be highly dependent on the phase difference between the, the two field. Then we are in a very good position to discuss the phenomena which we just see uh, uh, in, in the demo, okay? So before I actually uh, perform the calculation, and to give you the explanation. I would like to take a vote as of usual, okay? So the question we are asking is, in addition to what we see in the demo, we see a colorful uh, bubble, okay? How thick is a soft film such that you can see color from the refracted light? The first option is maybe it's like one millimeter which is possible, right? And it is about the size of the head of a pin, okay? Or it can be 100 micron, so that's actually about the size, the thickness is about the size of the human hair, or 100 uh, nanometer, which is the size of the virus, okay? How many of you think the thickness is roughly one millimeter? Can you raise your hand? Nobody thinks so? Really? <laughs> okay. Basically, nobody thinks that's the case. How about 100 micron? How many of you think so? How about uh, 100 nanometer? How many of you? Okay, so that is actually the, uh, the, the vote, and we are going to know the result very soon. And uh, how about the rest? <laughs> okay, cool. So now we are going to solve the, the, the puzzle. So, just a quick reminder about what we have learned from the last lecture, okay? So there's a reason why we have the lecture uh, uh, first on the refraction of the electromagnetic wave before uh, we discuss the color of the what, uh, of the bubble. So from the last lecture, suppose I have two material which form uh, an interface between the material number one with refractive index N1 and uh, the second material have refractive index N2, okay? If I have an incident wave, incident electromagnetic plane wave, and uh, the, the incident angle is actually, uh, 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 in, in this case, zero, so that means this incident plane wave is actually propagating in the direction which is actually hitting the surface directly, okay? So if the initial amplitude is A, okay, what we have learned from last time is that there will be refractive wave, which is actually R times A. R is actually the refractive in, uh, coefficient, okay, refraction coefficient. And then finally, you, you have also the transmitted wave, which actually I have uh, Okay, now I call it T times A, and where T is the transmission coefficient, okay? 
from the exercise which we uh, actually already uh, done last time, R is equal to N1 minus N2 divided by N1 plus N2. And while the transmission coefficient is actually T equal to 2N1 divided by N1 plus N2. Okay? So basically, what I'm actually talking about here is a conclusion from the exercise we have done in the last, last lecture. Okay? Just a quick reminder. All right? So I would like to discuss with you various of situation related to R value. Okay? So the N1 and the N2 are related to the property of the first median and the second median, right? So it could be that N1 and N2 are like uh, N1 is actually greater than N2, okay? So if N1 is greater than N2 in the experimental setup, so that means the R will be greater than zero, right? Okay, because R is actually N1 minus N2 divided by the sum of N1 and N2, right? Therefore, uh, what I'm going to get is something like this. So basically, I'm going to have an incident wave like this, or say I use the notation pointing upward, okay? Once they got refracted, it is actually still uh, like this, pointing upward, because the, the r is actually greater than zero. There is no changing sign uh, in the amplitude, right? Therefore, uh, there's no flip in amplitude. If the, the n1 is actually greater than n2. Okay? On the other hand, the transmitted wave, if you look at the functional form of the transmitted wave, uh, 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 transmission coefficient, t is actually equal to 2n1 divided by n1 plus n2. Okay? It's always positive, right? Therefore, will be any possibility to flip the sign? No, right? You are absolutely right. So, therefore, what is going to happen is that I will use this little arrow to keep track of uh, the, the sign change. Basically, you will see that after it passes through the boundary, there will be no change in sign in amplitude, okay? Uh, no matter what happens. On the other hand, if I have the situation n1 smaller than n2, what is going to happen? If you calculate, the R value, it will be negative, right? In this case, R will be smaller than zero. So what is going to happen is that if initially you have something which is actually, uh, uh, the incident wave have uh, amplitude, positive amplitude, and I keep track of the, the sign of this amplitude by this arrow pointing up, okay? Because the r is actually smaller than zero. Therefore, there's a split in sign in the amplitude. Okay? So what is going to happen? So the refractive wave will look like this. And I use this arrow to keep track of the flip in amplitude. And finally, as I mentioned before, the transmitted wave, the t, is always positive. Therefore, there will be no change in sign in amplitude. Okay? Finally, the third example is if I have somehow two different materials, but they have the same refractive index. What is going to happen is that there will be no refraction and uh, everything goes through. Okay? Even if you have two different kinds of material, but if they have the same refractive index, then what is going to happen is that everything will pass through, and what you are going to get uh, is that you will have no refracted light, uh, meaning R is actually equal to zero. Any questions so far? Okay. I would like to make sure that everybody understand the consequence uh, of this calculation. 
So if I introduce no flip in amplitude, this means that this contribution will introduce uh, delta equal to zero. So basically, there will be no change in the phase, right? Because there's no flip in amplitude. On the other hand, if uh, there's a changing sign in amplitude, what will be the resulting delta value? Can somebody actually tell me? It will be pi, right? Very good. So that means you are getting hit by a phase difference of pi. Therefore, the amplitude change by a factor of cosine pi, which is minus 1. OK? So that is actually something pretty important uh, when we have the discussion of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, soap, uh, soap uh, bubble uh, refraction. Uh, all right. So let me uh, give you a quick example about what is actually the amount of the refracted light and also what is actually the amount of the transmitted light. OK, let me give you a concrete example. For example, if I have M1 equal to 1, which is actually the refractive index of the air, and uh, N2 equal to 1.5, OK? If that happens, what is, going to, what is uh, uh, the resulting uh, uh, intensity? OK, just a quick reminder, average I, the, uh, the intensity, uh, average intensity will be uh, equal to C times N times epsilon 0, uh, A squared divided by 2, where A is the amplitude of the, the electric field. OK? Just a quick reminder. And this uh, 1 over 2 is coming from the time average. OK? Just a reminder. All right, so now I can go ahead and use these two formula, R and P, to calculate the refractive, uh, refraction coefficient and the transmission coefficient. So R will be equal to uh, 1 minus 1.5 divided by 1 plus 1.5. So basically, you get minus 0.5 divided by 2.5. OK? And that is actually going to give you minus 0.2, right? Of course, I can also calculate what will be uh, the t, which will be uh, 2 divided by 2.5. So basically, what you are getting is 0 0.8, OK? So I can now calculate what will be the, the resulting uh, intensity of the refracted light, OK? Everybody is following, right? So what would be the intensity of the refracted light, OK? This will be equal to um, minus 0.2 squared, right? Because the average intensity is proportional to A squared, right? A is actually the amplitude of the electric field, OK? R actually tell you what is actually the relative amplitude between the re refracted light and the, trend, uh, and the incident light, right? OK, therefore, you are getting hit by 0.2 squared uh, multiplied by the initial uh, 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 intensity, OK? Basically, what you are going to get is 0 0.04 I initial intensity. OK, so basically, 4% of the light is refracted. OK, that may surprise you a bit, right? Because when you see, uh, for example, the, the, the soap bubble, you see that it's still pretty bright, right? But in reality, only 4% of the light, or 4% of the intensity got refracted. OK, that is because your eye is actually highly nonlinear. Your response of eye, your, your eye uh, responds to the, or say, uh, receiving or interpreting the, the intensity is really highly nonlinear. OK, so basically you get 4% uh, uh, refracted. 
and then the rest actually uh, goes through. And, uh, and uh, just to convince you that the, the total intensity is 100%, uh, we can calculate what would be uh, the, uh, the, the intensity of the transmitted light. This will be equal to 1.5. This is actually from related to N2, OK? Right? Because the intensity is proportional to Cn epsilon 0 a squared over 2, OK? Times uh, t squared. So basically, you have point A squared, right? And the I initial uh, intensity, OK? And if I calculate this value, basically, you are going to get 96% of the initial intensity. So 96% of the initial intensity actually pass through the, the boundary and, uh, and uh, continue and propagate in the second uh, medium, which is actually, in this case, this is the soap. All right? So the picture is the following. When 100% of light, OK? intensity going toward the boundary. What is going to happen is that 4% of the light got refracted. 4% of the intensity got refracted. And also, because N1 is smaller than N2, therefore, there is a flip in sign in the intensity, also oh, sorry, in, in, the, in the amplitude. And the rest continue, 96% of them. And uh, there's no flipping sign in the amplitude. Any questions so far? We are really pretty close. OK. So now we are in a position to discuss what is actually really happening uh, to this uh, soap bubble. OK? So, so uh, I'm going to keep this uh, formula, uh, this uh, result here. And I will now discuss a situation which you have three, uh, actually two interfaces. So suppose I run in, run and run in this uh, uh, soap bubble, OK, and put it on the board, OK? So this is actually the soap, soap, all right? And I have now an incident wave, which is actually going into uh, this bubble, this bubble, OK? So now I have 100%, which is actually going toward this, uh, uh, this view. So after uh, this light, this uh, plane wave hit the, the, the film, what is going to happen? The first thing which happen is that there will be 4% of the light got refracted, right? OK, N2 is equal to 1.5. It's the same setup, just a reminder, just to make sure. Everybody is in the same, on the same page, right? So 4% of the light got refracted. Of course, the sign changed. 96% of the intensity as you continue. And what is actually happening is that uh, there will be no change in amplitude inside, OK? And this is actually not the end of the story, right? Because the light will continue and continue to propagate. What is going to happen is that it will reach another boundary where it's actually coming, the, the, the incident light is actually traveling from N2, refractive index material, to N1, which is actually the end. Okay? Now I have a situation where the light is actually going through the boundary and going out of the air, OK? That means the light is actually going into the bubble, OK? So this is actually inside, inside the bubble. 
All right? So what is going to happen is the following. Basically, the calculation is the same, except that now the r is actually 0.2 instead of minus 0.2, right? Because now r, uh, n2 minus n1 is actually 0.5. 0.5 divided by 2.5 is positive 0.2. All right, so basically what you are going to get is a refracted light, which is actually doesn't change, doesn't change the sign of the amplitude. And what is actually the, 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 the intensity? The intensity will be 96% times 4%, right? Because only 4% of the light got refracted. And of course, a large fraction of the light as you pass through the bubble, 96% times 96%. And uh, this would be, again, pointing upward because T is always positive. OK? Any questions so far? OK? You can see that this is actually really interesting because most of the light as you pass through the, 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 the bubble, right? OK? So that's actually already one thing we learned from this exercise. Now, what is going to happen to this light? If I continue and increase the, the time, what is going to happen is that this refracted light from the second surface or second boundary, okay, will go backward and pass through the first boundary again. Okay? So that is going to what is going to happen is the following. So basically, we are going to get again transmitted light and the refracted light. Okay? The refracted light, what would be the sign of the refracted light? For, well, the arrow pointing up or down? Uh, up. up. Yeah, very good. So by now, if you are bored, then that means I am very successful. <laughs> All right? So that means I'm getting 4% times 96% times 4%. Okay? What would be the sign for the transmitted light? Pointing up or down? Up, very good. So everybody gets it, right? And the 96% pass through. 96% times 96% times 4% will pass. OK? And of course, I can now continue and continue. What is going to happen is that now you have learned AO3. You will see that this is a crazy phenomenon, right? What is going to happen is that there will be a tiny fraction of a light which is trapped forever between the two surfaces. They are going to be bouncing <laughs> back and forth boop, 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 forever. OK? Of course, the, the fraction of the intensity is really, really small. OK? It's because every time you got the refraction actually happen, you take a hit of 4%. Right? But uh, since we are talking about uh, theoretical physics, so theoretical data will continue forever. OK, that's actually pretty interesting. <laughs> and uh, going back to practical uh, situation, basically, I can safely ignore any further refraction because they are hit so hard, because uh, they are, every time I get the 4% hit. Right? Therefore, I can ignore all the other contribution. And the, what we are actually seeing is what? Our eye is here. Okay. We see the contribution of the first pass, which is actually refracted from the first surface. The second pass is that, okay, it passed through the first surface, got refracted from the second uh, boundary, and passed through the first boundary uh, 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 in, the, in the second uh, round, and then uh, also uh, reaching your eye. OK? So what are we looking at? We are looking at the superposition of two electromagnetic waves coming from one, which is like this, and two, which is actually like this. OK? The question now is, what is the thickness of 
the, the film, which now I can define the thickness or say the width of this uh, film to be D. Okay? Now the question we are actually uh, asking is what will be the thickness D, okay, which is needed such that I can have constructive interference? Okay, now the question becomes really clear. And we can actually uh, calculate uh, that by evaluating the phase difference between the path number one and the path number two. Okay, so now what I need in order to have constructive interference, I need a specific phase difference. For the, before that, I need to calculate the phase difference first. between one, pass number one, and the pass number two. Okay, what would be the pass, uh, phase, phase difference? The phase difference delta will be equal to, of course, pi. This pi contribution is coming from the flip of the amplitude, right? That will actually give you an extra pi phase difference. The second phase difference is coming from the difference in the optical pass length. You can see that the first uh, pass, it doesn't go into the film. Okay, it got refracted uh, uh, directly. And the, 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 the second uh, pass, which is pass number two, it, it takes more effort or more time for, this, uh, uh, the, for, for the light to go, go back and reach your eye. Okay, how big is the, the pass length difference? The, the size of the pass length difference is 2 times d, right? All right. Of course, I need to actually translate that back to uh, the, the phase, right? So, so, two, so, so first, I, I need to actually calculate how many period. So the length divided by lambda will be the period, right? So lambda is actually Lambda is actually the wave length of the incident light, okay? But I am missing a factor here. Can, I, can somebody help me? Because this lambda is actually inside the material, right? So which factor I'm missing? N2, right? Yeah, thank you very much. So basically, inside the material, since the speed of light is 1.5 times smaller than the speed of light in vacuum, Therefore, uh, the speed, the, the, sorry, the, the wavelength is actually lambda divided by N2, okay? And this is actually the number of period, and now I need to translate that to phase difference. Therefore, I multiply this by two pi, okay? So you can see that now I have successfully evaluated or quantified the phase difference between pass number one and two, that is, there are two contributions. The first one is pi is related to the, the flip in amplitude, okay? The second contribution, the blue one, is actually coming from the optical uh, pass length difference, okay? And uh, of course, you can evaluate that uh, really uh, uh, precisely. Therefore, we can now quickly conclude that uh, in order to have constructive, in, constructive interference, okay, I need to have delta equal to 2n pi, where n is an integer, okay? And uh, in order to have destructive interference, uh, I need to have uh, I need to have delta equal to 2n plus 1 pi, which is actually uh, the result of the uh, calculation which we have done, uh, I think, uh, before. Uh, yeah, there. So this is actually based on the, the calculation we have done in the beginning. OK? So we are really close. So now we have this result. Delta is equal to pi plus 2d 
divide, uh, times two pi divided by lambda divided by n two, right? So this complicated formula. Now we are in the position to evaluate what will be the, the, uh, the phase difference. So the first thing which I would like to discuss is that when d goes to 0, what is actually the limit? The limit is that when the, 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 uh, the width of the, uh, the, the, the film is really, really small, goes to 0, OK? What is going to happen? You are going to have destructive Interference. Why is that? That is because even when you have d equal to 0, the delta is pi because of the flip in sign in the first uh, uh, pass number, uh, number one. OK? The second thing is that now I can calculate what would be the constructive interference uh, with. Okay, so this will happen when d is equal to 2n minus 1 lambda divided by 4 and 2. So basically, you can use uh, that formula there, okay, and uh, solve d. Then basically, that's the formula we are going to get. And I will, I will not go into detail for this. Okay, any questions so far? OK, so now if I, so the third conclusion is that if I fix, if I fix D and the lambda and the, and the change lambda, OK, so that is actually the, the more, more practical situation, right? Because I have the soap bubble, and it have a well-defined width, which is D. Okay, and what is happening is that I'm trying to shine this soap bubble with light with different wavelengths, right? Okay, so so that is actually the third situation. If I fix the the width of the the, the film and change the the wave uh, length lambda, okay, what I'm going to get is that the lambda max, which is the wavelength needed to have constructive interference, OK? OK, lambda max will be equal to 4d n2 divided by 2n minus 1. So basically, I can solve the lambda if I am given a d value. OK? So actually, we already get the answer we are asking in the beginning. OK? The first question is, why do we see color? The second question is, when I see color, what is actually the width of the soft film? We are going to know the result in a moment. So now I have this formula in hand. If I have d, okay, roughly equal to 100 nanometer, okay, which is the, the second option, which we were discussing. Uh, so, so, okay, so, so uh, which is the, the third uh, uh, option we were discussing, okay? All right. If d is roughly 100 nanometer, okay, so that is going to give you lambda maxima equal to 4 times 100 nanometer times 1.5. N2 is 1.5 divided by 2n minus 1. OK, so that is actually 600 nanometer divided by 2n minus 1. OK. Suppose I have n equal to 1, basically I'm getting 400, uh, sorry, 600 nanometer. Suppose I have n equal to 2, okay, 2n minus 1 is actually 4 minus 1 is 3, therefore you get 200 nanometer. 
and the two, 120 nanometer, etc., etc., which are the required wavelengths, okay, in order to have constructive interference between pass number one and the pass number two. Okay, everybody is following? All right. If I plot the spectra of this lambda max, assuming D is 100 nanometer, okay, what I'm getting is like this. Okay, so this is a, a situation of very thin film. Okay, so this is the lambda. Okay, what I'm getting is that okay, there will be a maxima here, which you say should be uh, 600 nanometer. Okay, red color is actually roughly. 600, uh, 650 nanometer is the red, right? And the, the, this is actually roughly the range of the visible light, okay? Which is actually between lambda equal to lambda violet, okay? Violet is equal to 400 nanometer, right? So you can see that the first uh, maxima, lambda maxima, where you have constructive interference is at 600 nanometer. Okay, so that means you are going to see what kind of color in your soap bubble. You are going to see red, right? And then the, sec the, the next uh, uh, wavelength which you can ca have constructive interference is 200 nanometer. Now this should be shorter than the wavelength of the violet light. It's out of the range of the visible light. Okay, what is going to happen? Your eye will not see it, <laughs> right? All right, so the, the next one will be here, whatever, blah, 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 which I don't care because they are so short in wavelengths and you cannot see them, okay? So you can see that if I have a width which is roughly 100 nanometer, very thin, situation. What is going to happen? What is going to happen is that you are going to get only one maxima in the visible light range. And therefore, you can see color. Okay? Any questions so far? Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is take the same formula here, but now I would like to uh, change uh, the, this, uh, uh, the D. So now I would like to change the D to consider a situation where you have a very thick layer, okay? So now I would like to change the situation to a very thick layer. So maybe I need to erase this part of the board to make some space. So now if I have D, equal to 100 micron, okay? What is going to happen? So I can now still use this formula to calculate what would be the lambda maxima, okay? So lambda maxima will be equal to 600 micron, which is uh, when you have n equal to one, okay? But this wavelength is way, way large much, much larger than the wavelength of the visible light, okay? So it's not going to work, okay? Therefore, you have to be patient. You have to increase the n value until n is equal to 500, <laughs> right? So I, I'm calculating uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, until 500. Ah, we are in the visible light range, right? Okay, now high hundred will give you 600.6 nanometer. Suddenly your eye can see it. Okay, very good. That's very nice, right? So I can now put it in my diagram. Okay, this is actually the wavelength. Again, okay, and the, ah, I get one line here. Okay, how about the next one? N equal to 501. I'm going to get 599.4 nanometer. It's pretty close to this one, 
And then the next one will be 599, uh, sorry, 598.2 nanometer if n is equal to 502. And what you are getting is, uh, oh, you can see that, no, things are not going very well, right? They are full spectra, all the uh, very, very narrow, very, very, very uh, large number of wavelengths can give you constructive interference. So what is going to happen? What is going to happen is that you and I will see refraction with all kinds of different wavelengths. And what color is that? White. You are going to see something which is white. OK? So that is actually the answer to our question. So what would be the required the thickness? The required thickness is something like 100 nanometer. So you can see how thin is the water bubble. OK? That may surprise some of you, right? Most of you actually didn't think that's actually that thin. OK? Secondly, if d equal to 0, you are going to have destructive interference. That means there will be no refracted light. Everything is going to pass through, and the, the bubble is like transparent. Okay. Finally, when the bubble is really thick, okay, you are going to see white. Okay. So let me uh, finish this lecture with a demonstration here. First, before I turn off the light, I would like to turn this on. Okay. So what I have here is, is a, a very complicated machine. Okay, it's not that complicated, actually. <laughs> so basically, I have a light source here, which emit uh, light with all kinds of different paths, oh, uh, uh, all kinds of different wavelengths. Okay, and I have a, this a little device here, the soap solution inside. And I can actually rotate from outside. You, need, you see how sweet is this uh, setup, OK? And uh, I can actually create a soap film out of this, OK? You can see that I'm rotating and trying to actually project the result on the wall. You can see that initially, uh, there's nothing uh, really uh, striking in the beginning. You can see that the light is which color? It's white, right? OK? Uh, remember, there's a, the, there's a uh, because of the optical <laughs> setup, there's, uh, this, this image is actually upside down, OK? So, so the upper edge is actually, the, uh, uh, the upper edge of that image is actually the lower edge of uh, my setup, OK? Which I, uh, is the lower edge of my soap film, OK? A uh, soap film, OK? And the due to gravity, Right? We, have, we have gravity, right? So that I can walk around, right? Due to gravity, you can see that there will be more and more thicker, uh, you will form a thicker and a thicker layer in the bottom of my uh, uh, experimental setup or in the upper edge of the image. On the other hand, due to gravity, the upper edge or the lower edge of the uh, uh, of the image will become thinner and thinner as a function of time. At some point, the color will start to show up. As you can see now, since we wait uh, long enough, there are more, the, 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 uh, the soft film becomes thinner and thinner. And you can see that their color popping out. Right? It's like rainbow. Why is that? Because we, I am burying the thickness of the uh, film as a function of uh, the vertical distance, right? So therefore, you can see that this is actually showing you that different D value will give you very different color. And uh, if we wait long enough, basically what we are going to get is that the, uh, you, the whole film will become more and more colorful. 
And uh, I am sure that after this class, you can walk out of the classroom and explain to your friend that why the soap bubble is colorful. Thank you very much. And uh, if you have uh, any questions, I will be around. And of course, if you want to make your own soap bubble, you can actually go ahead and uh, play the demo here. Okay, so hello everybody. So uh, we are going to show you a demonstration uh, which we can see a uh, colorful interference pattern from a uh, soft film. Uh, so, so basically, we, uh, the experimental setup is uh, like this. So basically, we have light, which is trying to shine this uh, uh, thin layer of soft film. And, uh, and, and uh, uh, this, uh, the result is actually projected on the screen. And uh, you can see at first, you don't really see uh, a lot of uh, colorful pattern uh, because the, uh, the thickness of the film is still rather uh, uh, large, uh, rather thick. So therefore, uh, you don't really see a lot of pattern. But as a function of time, you can see that this pattern is actually changing because uh, of gravitational uh, uh, force. Uh, you, will, you, you will be able to see that uh, the, the, the lower part of the, uh, the film becomes thicker and thicker, and then the upper part of the film, uh, which you, you see that upside down on the screen, is actually becoming thinner and thinner. When, uh, as, uh, as we actually uh, discussed during the class, when the soft film is thin enough, there will be only one or only a few uh, 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 maximas uh, in the interference pattern as a function of uh, 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 wavelengths, uh, uh, which happen to be inside the visible light range. And then you can see that now really, uh, this colorful pattern really developed, it's really beautiful, and, uh, and uh, you can see that uh, 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 the, the lower part of the uh, experiment uh, really uh, have a fainter color because there are multiple uh, uh, maximas uh, in, in the visible light range. On the other hand, in the upper part of the, uh, the, the film, uh, you, you typically have a very li uh, little number of maximas or only have one maximas in the visible light range. Uh, as a function of wavelengths. Therefore, you see really, really dramatic and uh, very, very colorful pattern developed from this experiment. 